questions, Kessian Rel, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. It's good to see the Prime Minister here uh, visiting Canada uh, to uh, fill up the gas in his private jet. But if things are bad on the ground in Canada, if the Financial Post says uh, that in Toronto, students are living in shelters for the homeless, the use of food banks is at record highs in history. It is really the worst time to increase costs for Canadians. Will the Prime Minister cancel the tax increases on gas, heating, food and paychecks? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start by congratulating once again the member for Carleton, who is now the leader of the official opposition. And seeing as we are all back in the House of Commons now, I know that we have a lot of work to do this fall together. On this side of the House, we will focus on help for Canadians to create an economy that works for everyone. We will invest in creating more housing to counter the cost of living, to fight climate change, to help the, uh, the middle class and to help make communities safer and to put more money back into the most vulnerable families in Canada. And we hope that all Canadians will work with us. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The has effectively admitted that his carbon tax has not worked and therefore he needs to triple it. Uh, according to the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, the forthcoming hike in the carbon tax will mean that the total cost for a Newfoundland senior living in the countryside on their heating bill will have been 80 percent. Canadians cannot afford that. But just for clarity, if, for, if you are a Newfoundland senior, how much will your home heating bill rise as a result of the forthcoming hike in the Liberal carbon tax? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, like all parliamentarians, uh, we have each heard stories from Canadians who are struggling uh, with the high cost of living, with the inflation that's been caused by the global crisis. That's why we're putting forward concrete measures that are going to help Canadians. We're going to double the D GST tax credit that's going to hit millions of families with extra support. We're delivering on uh, low, uh, low uh, support for low-income low families on dental, uh, and we're also moving forward with support for low-income rent. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition has an opportunity to support these measures and get help directly to Canadians. Here, here. I hope he does exactly that. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, the, 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 the Leader of the Liberal Party has an opportunity to respect the fact that heating your home in January and February in Canada is not a luxury. And it is, does not make those Canadians polluters. They're just trying to survive. This That's from right. a Prime Minister right. who burned more jet fuel in one month than 20 average Canadians burn in an entire year. So will the Prime Minister ground the jet, park the hypocrisy and axe the tax hikes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're going to continue to stay focused on direct and real help for Canadians, responding to the challenges they're facing with meaningful measures that are going to help millions of Canadians in the middle class and those working hard to join it. Uh, if Canadians had followed the advice of the Leader of the Opposition and invested in volatile cryptocurrencies in an attempt to, quote, opt out of inflation, they would have lost half of their savings. Mr. Speaker, responsible leadership right. means stepping up for Canadians and being there to support them. Will the Conservative leader support our measures to support Canadians? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We will not support tax hikes on Canadians. Speaking of tax hikes, they plan to raise taxes on paychecks. Now, yesterday, the Finance Minister claimed that all the EI tax hikes that they would collect would go to EI benefits. In fact, I looked it up over the next three years. They're going to collect $10 billion more in EI taxes than they pay out in EI benefits, allowing the Prime Minister to grab up the difference and use it to feed his insatiable spending appetites. Canadians can't afford a bigger bite off their paychecks. Will the Prime Minister cancel his tax hikes on Canadian paychecks? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I think in this House it's important to look at the facts. And the facts are that when the Leader of the Opposition was the Minister responsible for employment insurance, uh, it, premiums were 20 per cent higher for workers than they are now. That's right. Workers pay 20 per cent more. Uh, that's why uh, we're continuing to move forward to support workers. On the issue of the CPP, uh, we promise to be there for workers as they become seniors to help them with their retirements, and that's exactly what we did. And in regards to uh, pricing pollution, we promised it would no longer be free to pollute anywhere in this country, and it no longer is. That's what we're focused on. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister is quite wrong. Today, payroll taxes on the average $60,000 a year worker are about $700 higher than when we left office. And by the way, we left with a balanced budget. Now, yes, now he wants to raise those taxes even further. Bigger bite off Canadian paychecks at a time when inflation is at a 40-year high, when students are forced to live in homeless shelters, and when home ownership rates are at the lowest level in a generation. Doesn't he understand that now is the worst time to raise taxes? Will he cancel those tax hikes? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition wants to go back in time. Let's look at what he was doing when he was in government. He continued to deliver child benefit checks to millionaire families, which we ended when we took office. And then he voted against uh, raising taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them on the middle class. And he voted against uh, a Canada child benefit that delivers hundreds of dollars a month tax-free to every Canadian family. We've seen where this Leader of the Opposition stands. On this side of the aisle, we're going to stay focused on helping Canadians for real. The Honourable Member for Belle Isle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start by expressing my joy that the Prime Minister is here with us once again. I missed him, Mr. Speaker. And we will no longer need the NDP to tell us what the Liberals think. Well, we can take up our work once again, and now that the tributes to the monarchy have been given, and, I, and we're talking about singing, and now I'd like to talk about this to the Prime Minister, because there are singers and creators in who, or francophone who saw their royalties paid to uh, English-speaking artists. Does he have the intention, does the Prime Minister have the intention to ensure that this does not continue, the Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, as a government, and particularly during the pandemic, but in the last seven years, we have always been there for artists throughout this country. We know how much of a contribution our artists make to our identity, to our culture as well, the culture that we share with the world, and we will always be there to defend our artists. It's, it, it's important to make sure that everyone is treated equally, and that's what we're doing. The member for Belle Chambly. Yes, that's the same answer we hear on every for every question. It's always an empty an answer. So we know that the Copyright Council can make sure that royalties are distributed fairly. If the government doesn't know what to do, well, we know what to do. Two things. First, artists have to be paid fairly in any way required. So, And we have to make sure that this situation does not happen again in the future. And because once again, the Prime Minister will just say, oh, I'm concerned about the status of French, but he will do nothing. The Honourable. Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of, of the House, we will always be there for artists. We will always recognize the essential work that they do. We recognize, and I recognize with pride, uh, the extraordinary artists in Quebec who contribute enormously to Canadian culture and culture throughout the world. And that is why we will always be sure to ensure that all Canadas in Canada are uh, remunerated fairly. The high cost of living is hurting people. We've got a Prime Minister that could have listened to our plan in the spring to put more of people's own money back in their pockets, and people would have received that by July. But he was too busy telling people that things are worse in other countries. And then we've got a leader of the Conservative Party who can't figure out if they're for or against putting more people, more money in people's pockets. New Democrats believe that people need respect. Why is this government taking so long to put more of their own money in Canadians' pockets to help them out to afford their groceries in this difficult time? 
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the very first bills we've put forward in this Parliament are focused on delivering for Canadians and the middle class and those working hard to join it who are struggling during these challenging times. We heard from Canadians from coast to coast to coast that they need more help. And that's why we're stepping up by doubling the GST tax credit, by delivering more help for low-income renters, and by ensuring uh, that families with kids under 12 who are struggling to pay and make ends meet uh, can deliver dental care for those kids. These are initiatives that I think all of us should be able to get behind, and I hope all parliamentarians will support them to help Canadians as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Uh, the cost of living is rising and it's hurting people, but we have a Prime Minister who's saying that it's worth in other countries rather than taking action, and we have a leader of the Conservative Party who thinks that we can opt out of inflation by buying cryptocurrencies. We have one party that says nothing, another party that does nothing, and we are acting to help people. That's what we're doing. So why is it that those two leaders are not acting to help people out in these difficult times? Uh, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have all heard from our constituents, we are members of parliament, we've heard from families in our ridings who are having a difficult time, and that is why the first bills that have been tabled now here in the fall have been to help Canadians through direct assistance with the GST credit that will be doubled and with more money for low-income renters as well. And we are going to help families with the cost of dental care for their youngest. And we are going to help, and we hope that all members of parliament will help us with that. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Canadians who are having a hard time and that this government says it wants to help. It's exactly the opposite. That's the opposite is happening. So bad news for Canadians. In Jan on January 1st, the government will increase the workers' tax. Also on April 1st, the Liberal carbon tax will triple, so it will cost more money for Canadian families to survive. So why can't the Prime Minister tell Canadians why he is increasing taxes when uh, Canadians need more money in their own pockets? Uh, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the Conservative MP. Yesterday, uh, the uh, member for Leeds Thousand Islands, Grenville Rideau Lake, uh, said that he could support our plan that would help with uh, inflation for Canadian households. So that was good news. And, and I hope that the Conservative member will support his own colleague and his own party and will also convince all Conservatives to support our excellent plan. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, uh, Mr. Speaker, I am very happy to see the Prime Minister here in this House, particularly since he was able to see a number of his counterparts in the last few days. Do you know that Canada is the only G7 country that has not decreased taxes? Why is that? Because other countries understand that that giving that it'll help Canada, it'll help families to pay less income tax. So why is the Liberal government increasing taxes when it's going to hurt Canadian families even more? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is yet another example of conservative hypocrisy. The conservatives are the ones who were against our measures to support the middle class. The conservatives were against our tax cut for the middle class. The conservatives were against the federal minimum wage of $15. The Conservatives were against giving up interest on federal loans to students. Liberal tax hikes, inflation and never-ending spending is crushing Canadians. Even the Bank of Canada admits that this Prime Minister's spending spree should have ended long ago. Failed Liberal policies are making eating, heating and driving a luxury in this country. More Canadians and newcomers are turning to food banks because feeding their family is becoming impossible. Will this government put an end to the suffering they're causing and cancel their planned tax increases? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government does recognize that times are tough for a lot of Canadians. 
And yesterday, I was pleased to learn that the member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes also recognizes that, and that he will support our plan to provide relief of nearly $500 per family for 11 million Canadian households. That's real support for the Canadians who need it the most. I hope all the members opposite will join us in supporting that plan. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals continue punishing Canadians for heating their homes and driving to work. While this leave-it-in-the-ground, left-wing, climate-zealot government is happy shutting down essential energy projects and adding more taxes, even the PBO says that the government's claim that any sort of carbon tax rebate helps families is misleading. In fact, 60% of households in my province of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Ontario are worse off because of the Liberals' climate virtue signaling. So will this government cancel their carbon tax hikes and put this suffering to an end that they're causing on Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Speaker, we are totally focused on addressing the affordability challenge for Canadian families and I know talking to my residents in the West and Winnipeg South, uh, Mr. Speaker, they very much appreciate the measures the Finance Minister introduced the other day and, and Mr. Speaker, that's why it's important that the price on pollution, the climate action rebate, will put more money in people's pockets, families' pockets and uh, very, very importantly, Mr. Speaker, the rebate checks are going to be in people's mailboxes in October. Uh, that's going to help with affordability. That's going to help families with cash flow. For Barry Innisfil. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government can misrepresent the facts on the carbon tax all they like, but Canadians know it costs them more. The parliamentary budget officer confirms that the carbon tax will cost families more than they get back, and when the Liberals triple the tax on gas, heat, and groceries, it'll cost an Ontario household $1,500 more. Mr. Speaker, given the PBO's credibility and independence, I believe Canadians, and Canadians should believe him rather than the spin from the other side. So again, for the sake of every family struggling, will the government cancel their planned tax increases? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know there are affordability challenges for uh, Canadian families, and, and that's why our climate plan is designed so the majority of families receive more in climate action incentive payments than they pay at the pump. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg to differ, but the Parliamentary Budget Officer uh, still uh, remains that uh, 8 out of 10 families will be better off. And, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member will know, as the carbon price increases, also the climate action incentive payments increase, Mr. Speaker. Member for Barry Innisville. What a week this has been sitting here listening to these Liberals justify their inaction to solve the inflation and cost of living crisis that they've created and things are simply getting worse. Canadian families are on bended knees under the weight of trying to afford the necessities of life and what's their solution? It's to pile on the misery with planned tax increases on gas, groceries and home heating by increasing the carbon tax. For the sake of every Canadian family who's struggling, Mr. Speaker, will the government cancel their planned tax increases. The Honourable Minister. Since we have come into government, we have done everything we can to support Canadian families, which is the exact opposite of what the Conservatives have done. In fact, Mr. Speaker, they voted against the tax cut for middle class families. In fact, Mr. Speaker, they voted against the Canada Child Benefit, which sends thousands of dollars to Canadian families in need every single year. And, Mr. Speaker, they're against the National Child Care Initiative that we have that is reducing child care fees by 50 per cent for families with children in child care. Mr. Speaker, we know the difficulties it is and the high cost of raising children, and we are there for Canadian families, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, representatives of workers who are unemployed are in Ottawa today. The spokesperson for the National Council of the Unemployed and the representative of the Montreal Unemployed Council even walked here. They have come to tell the Prime Minister that he must keep his promise to reform unemployment, to overhaul it. And in the meantime, it is unacceptable to end the temporary measures on Sunday. They walked 200 kilometers to tell him that can the Prime Minister rise and announce that he will extend the temporary measures? 
Mr. Speaker, I met with the representative of the National Council of the Unemployed and with the Guild of Musicians of Quebec, with the Quebec Union as well, and we talked about uh, an employment insurance system that would, would be fairer, that would be more agile, and that would meet the needs uh, of workers better. And I said that we would extend uh, the, uh, the, the benefits from 12 to 15 weeks, and they were very happy to hear that we're going to work together to modernize the EI system. The member for Thérèse de Blainville. Seriously, Mr. Speaker, and yes, that's not everything. The Canada Labour Congress, the Quebec Union, Construction Union, the Guild of Musicians of Quebec, uh, and members of the CNC are all on Parliament Hill to say that they do not accept to have the Prime Minister create this uncertainty for workers as of Sunday. Uh, the, Without reform of the EIS system, what it means that going back to the old system will abandon 70 percent of the workers who would need it. Will the Prime Minister correct the situation by Sunday? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this morning we talked about how important the temporary measures were during the pandemic. We also said that, of course, there are some temporary benefit programs that are ending, but the regular EI benefits will continue for workers, and we are about to announce our long-term plan to improve the EI system. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, ending the temporary measures for EI without a reform of the system means sending workers back to a program that was okay in the 70s. It was a program that leaves mothers who lose their jobs while they're on maternity leave in the, in the lurch. And it also does not support workers who are severely ill. There is nothing for uh, for um, t workers who work for themselves, for the self-employed. So really, and it doesn't recognize that industries are seasonal, not that wor workers are seasonal. So is this really the social safety net that the Prime Minister wants to give Quebecers? The Honourable Minister. Our government thinks that EI benefits should be more equitable, more reactive, and must meet the needs of Canadian workers. That is why we have committed, in partnership with stakeholders, the ones that I met this morning, to really overhaul the EI system. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, people in Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou are struggling to put food on their table and fuel in their cars. Yes, they are. Now, we know that the Prime Minister doesn't think about monetary policy and the budget hasn't balanced its itself. Not yet. We also know that ordinary citizens are under extraordinary financial pressures. So my question to the Prime Minister is this, Mr. Speaker. Will he cancel tax hikes that are planned so that we can give ordinary Canadians a break? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. If the member opposite bothered to read the fiscal monitor, he'd know that the budget was actually in surplus for five months uh, this spring. But um, I have a question for him, which is, I'd like to know, I just want to remind the honourable members that the honourable member for Kamloops Thompson Caribou asked a question. He wants to be able to hear the answer. The honourable uh, deputy prime minister from the top, please, so that the honourable member can hear the full answer. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, since the member seems interested in the economy, I want to give him an opportunity to clarify a point of conservative policy. I'd like to ask him if he agrees with the conservative leader that. Crypto is a good way to, quote, opt out of inflation. Does he agree with the Conservative leader's reckless advice to Canadians to invest in Bitcoin? Since the leader gave that advice, Bitcoin has crashed by 56%. Canadians who invested according to his advice would have seen their life savings destroyed. 
Is that your economic pol? Is that their economic policy, Mr. Speaker? Honorable member for Medicine Hat, Carson Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think this minister thinks that she's in opposition, and she will be soon enough. <laughs> not keeping up with the liberal tax hikes and the just inflation crisis. Canadians are falling further behind and they're becoming desperate and are losing hope. This government and its ministers are failing Canadians and their responses today are further proof of their inability to provide viable solutions and restore hope. Will this government cancel the payroll taxes on Canadians' paychecks? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Our government's approach is both fiscally responsible and compassionate. The Conservatives' approach is neither. Do the Conservatives really think that a family of four earning just $35,000 a year couldn't use $500 this fall to buy groceries? Do they think a low-income essential worker who is struggling to pay her rent couldn't use an extra $500? We know Canadians need this support. We know it's part of a AAA-rated, fiscally responsible approach, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Grazie, Signore Presidente. Frank, a father in my riding of Vaughan, is struggling to support his family of four. He currently works two jobs in order to put food on the table and gas in his car. These are not luxury items and they struggle to afford the necessities are taking a serious toll on his mental health and well-being. Will this government cancel their plan, tax increase on Frank and all Canadian taxpayers? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Grazie per la domanda, signora. We understand that Canadians are going through a difficult time and we understand they need support. Now we heard yesterday that there is at least one Conservative MP who understands that our doubling of the GST tax credit makes sense today. I'd like to ask all the Conservatives who I, I really would like to believe the Conservatives share our sincere desire to help Canadians. Join us in, with this measure. It will help the Honourable Member The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic has exposed the fact that the employment insurance system is less than ideal. During the emergency, the Liberals patched things up with temporary measures. Whilst promising that there would be real in-depth reform, the emergency measures end on Saturday. On Sunday, therefore, thousands of people will find themselves back on the old system that does not work. The unemployed deserve respect. Women, seasonal, part-time workers and freelancers all deserve respect. Will the Liberals wake up or will they send workers to be pushed around by a regime set up by the leader of the Conservative Party? The Honourable Minister for Labour. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to fully modernizing the EI system in Canada, of course. Some temporary programs, some temporary benefits during the pandemic are coming to an end, but standards and standing benefits will continue. Like before the pandemic, we look forward to launching our long-term plan. We are looking forward to offering 26 weeks of sick leave before December. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, while Canadians are struggling, oil companies are making record profits. Last quarter alone, Imperial Oil made $2.4 billion. New Democrats have been calling for a tax on these excess profits to help put more money back in people's pockets. But the Liberals have refused. Now the UN Secretary General is calling on countries to implement a windfall tax on big polluters. Will the Prime Minister finally do the right thing and make big oil pay their fair share? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has been and continues to be committed to be sure everyone in Canada pays their fair share. That's why we're permanently raising the corporate income tax by 1.5% on the largest, most profitable banks and insurance companies. And that's why we introduced a recovery dividend of 15% on the excess profits 
of these institutions during COVID. We've implemented, effective September 1st, a 10% luxury tax on private jets, luxury cars, and boats and yachts, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député de Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, we know the Canada-wide early learning and child care system is getting up and running from coast to coast to coast. Families in my hometown of Sudbury are already seeing the benefits of the transformative investments which Canada and the pro and provinces are making together. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development update this House on the milestones that Sudbury has reached as this national system is built out? The Honourable Minister of Families. Great. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague from Sudbury for that important question and for all of her hard work advocating on behalf of early learning and child care. I'm really pleased to announce that the City of Sudbury is moving forward with the Canada-wide Early Learning and Child Care Agreement and has already begun issuing rebates to families in Sudbury. Yeah. This is excellent news for families in Sudbury. I had the opportunity to visit Sudbury a couple of months ago to speak with providers and families about what this agreement means for them, and I'm excited to say that today they're delivering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The burden of inflated cost of living is especially felt by Canadians living in rural communities like mine. In northern Alberta, you have to heat your home. You must fill up your gas tank to travel for work, school, groceries and medical appointments. As Liberals increase taxes to pay for their reckless spending, they are leaving so many rural Canadians in the dark as they struggle to make ends meet. Will the government cancel their planned tax increases on paychecks, gas, home heating and groceries? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to talk to my honourable colleague across the way and tell her some things that we are doing. We know that high-speed internet is a connectivity issue for rural Canadians. Since 2015, Mr. Speaker, we've connected 1.2 million homes. By 2026, we're going to connect another 1.2 million homes. By 2026, Mr. Speaker, we'll have 98% of Canada connected to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. That's going to help rural Canadians get on par with urban Canadians. That is truly going to help all Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Tobik Mactaquak. Mr. Speaker, Atlantic Canadians and Canadians across the country are seeing their cost of living soar, including the cost to heat their homes. The Premier of Nova Scotia is concerned about the, the impacts of carbon pricing, saying, and I quote, almost 40% of Atlantic Canadians experience energy poverty and by far the highest rate in the country, end quote. These constant increases are hurting Canadians. When will the Prime Minister get off the backs of Atlantic Canadians, okay. put people first, stop these increases, and commit to no new taxes? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the uh, question. And, and, Mr. Speaker, we realize that there are very unique challenges uh, in Atlantic uh, Canada with the, the cost of living and, of course, the cost of uh, fuel. We made a commitment to be there for them, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to say the Minister of Environment just last week announced $120 million from the Low Carbon Economy Fund to help Atlantic Canadians transition away from heating oil to clean energy. Also, Mr. Speaker, as you know, there's the home retrofit program, which, which also will help with energy efficiency and saving money for Atlantic Canadians. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Mr. Speaker, my constituent Scary Russ is increasingly frustrated with the Prime Minister who has forgotten working Canadians. After paying mortgage, utility bills, gas, food, childcare and school fees, Kerry and her husband are left with $200 each month. The family does not qualify for a GST benefit. Their child benefit has been reduced. What Kerry Ross wants to, do, to know is, will the Prime Minister cancel his planned tax increases on paychecks, gas, home heating and groceries? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. I'm glad to hear the MP for Edmonton talk about the child care costs his constituents are facing. I very much believe that one of the important ways 
our government, governments across the country can support hardworking Canadian families is by making child care not a burden. For too many families, child care is like a second mortgage. Thanks to our early learning and child care plan, that burden is being lifted from Canadian families. And I'm pleased the province of Alberta has joined with us to do that for the members' constituents. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Speaker, with the Liberal carbon tax, input costs to heat a barn or dry grain have exploded. And I'm hearing daily from farmers how the Liberals' nonsensical fertilizer policy will devastate their businesses and increase the cost of food for Canadians even further. Many farms and farm families see Liberals' tax hikes as the killing blow. If farmers can't afford to live, they can't afford to grow the food we eat. It's simple. No farms, no food. Will the Liberals end their tax hikes on Canadian farmers? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The biggest threat to our food security is definitely the climate crisis. It's drought. When we face drought or floods that we have done last summer, we are in big troubles for our, for, for our food production. And this is why we are partnering with farmers. We are providing them fina with financial incentives so can, they can adopt good practices, reduce emissions, be more resilient in the face of climate, the climate crisis. We are there to support farmers, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, let's make one thing clear. Leaving Roxham Road open is not humane. It is encouraging a network of smugglers run by criminals who exploit the misery of the world. It is to be complicit in a business of desperation where criminals convince poor families on the basis of inaccurate information to pay up to $10,000 per person to cross these borders. A business made possible exclusively by the incompetence of the Canadian government in managing its borders and processing refugee claims. How can the government condone this? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe in a just and equitable system that protects the rights of refugees. We are working very closely with the Quebec government every year. We transfer hundreds of millions of dollars to welcome immigrants in Quebec, including refugees, and we have strengthened the integrity of our borders with a $321 million investment. It's good for Quebec. Refugees are contributing to Quebec and they're contributing to our economies and will continue like this. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, this is the height of hypocrisy because once the migrants have arrived in Canada, the government is unable to process the refugee claims. They end up worrying for years and after years, they find that half of the, well, it turns out that half of the families don't qualify as refugees and then they are deported. So the federal government lets criminals lie to families and ruin them in order to cross the border. It makes, the, it makes honest families wait for years before finally sending them back to their country. The federals are not helping migrants. They are helping criminals. Mr. Speaker, when will they suspend the safe third country agreement and end this inhumane racket? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, we collaborated hand in hand with the Quebec government, with Mr. Legault's government, creating a safe path for refugees, refugees that have contributed in the first line of our healthcare system. This is just one example among many, showing how refugees have tangibly and positively contributed to our country and will continue to strengthen the integrity of our borders with investments in order to add resources for the CBSA and other policing bodies, because here on this side of the House, we believe in a just and equitable system. Thank you. Honourable member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, just yesterday, the Justice Minister defended the Liberals' decision to eliminate mandatory jail time for crimes like robbery with a firearm, extortion with a firearm, weapons trafficking, and drive-by shootings. This was the very same day that his constituents in Montreal learned of yet another fatal shooting, this time at the Bell Centre, home of the Montreal Canadiens, a place where hockey fans and parents should be able to take their children and know that they're safe. When will this government act to protect Canadians and ensure that repeat violent offenders are put behind bars? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, 
serious, serious crimes will always carry serious consequences. That is the basic principle. What we are trying to do, Mr. Speaker, with Bill C-5 is to, is to make sure that we can concentrate our resources on those serious crimes, whether it's in the judicial system or whether it's enforcing, uh, it's enforcing our police officers. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was having a hard time hearing, and I'm sure the Honourable Member for Fundy Royal was having a hard time. Would the Honourable Minister mind starting from the top so that we can all hear the answer? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The fundamental point, Mr. Speaker, is that serious crimes will always carry serious consequences. What we are doing with Bill C-5, Mr. Speaker, is ensuring that we have more resources to focus on those serious crimes and ensure that our police authorities have more tools in their toolkit in order to deal with them. Mr. Speaker, former Justice of the Supreme Court Michael Moldaver, in an article he published this week, told us that we should go precisely in that direction to focus our resources on those serious crimes and incarcerate less people. And nobody, Mr. Speaker, can accuse Justice Moldaver of being soft on crime. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Speaker, Canadians expect that criminals convicted of sexual assault, kidnapping and human trafficking serve their sentence from behind bars, but not be soft on crime liberals with their do-no-crime Bill C-5, which incredibly allows criminals convicted of these and other serious offences to serve their sentence from home. So, can the Liberals explain how letting loose into the community the likes of sexual predators, kidnappers and human traffickers protects public safety? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, serious crimes such as those uh, de described by my, my honourable colleague, will always carry serious consequences. What Bill C-5, Mr. Speaker, does is in cases where a sentence would be less than two years and, Mr. Speaker, most importantly, there would be no, no threat to public safety or public security to allow for a better alternative to incarceration in those cases. This precisely allows us, Mr. Speaker, to focus our, our resources in the criminal justice system on those serious crimes, which we all agree we need to treat quite seriously. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Canadians still cannot believe that this Prime Minister wishes to abolish minimum sentences for crimes like illegal importation, intentional discharge, and robbery of a firearm. With the increase in violence and daylight killings on their streets, Montreal residents no longer recognize their city. For their part, gang members and organized crime are having a field day and looking forward to the adoption of Bill C-5. It gives more freedom to criminals, and people are locking themselves up because they're afraid. Does the Prime Minister commit to cancelling C5? The Honourable Minister for Justice. Mr. Speaker, quite the contrary to what the Honourable Member has just said. Serious crimes will still have serious consequences in our system. What we are doing with Bill C5 is abolishing a strategy that is chopping up the federal justice system, a system that has not worked, so that we may focus ourselves on serious crime that should have serious consequences. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member for dorval Salle. Mr. Speaker, Canadians and Quebecers deserve to feel safe in their communities. The tragedies caused by gun violence in recent months only serve to underscore the importance of taking action to combat gun violence on all sides. Can the Minister for Public Safety explain what steps the government is taking to create safer communities? Thank you. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her question. And I share her concerns. We are working very closely with the government of Quebec and municipal leaders like Mayor Plante to make our communities safer in Quebec. We've invested $46 million to support law enforcement in Quebec, $42 million to divert youth from a life of crime, and we continue to invest in strengthening our border to prevent illegal gun trafficking. 
We will be here for Montreal and Montrealers. Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, the cost of this Liberal government is driving up the cost of living. Over the past number of months, I have met with too many constituents who are barely getting by. They're finding it more difficult to pay their bills, feed their families, and are worried about losing their homes. In short, Mr. Speaker, there is too much money, too much month left at the end of the money. They simply cannot afford higher taxes. Will the Prime Minister cancel his planned tax increases? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's important to be clear with Canadians what is actually being discussed. And Canadians understand that the CPP and EI contributions every working Canadian makes are how we all pay for our retirement and how we create a safety net for every Canadian in case they lose their jobs. At a time of global economic uncertainty, it is the height of irresponsibility for the Conservatives to suggest that we as a country stop putting money away for our retirement and for a rainy day. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, this government's carbon tax will mean a massive price increase to home heating oil compared to a year ago. To quote the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland, Users of furnace oil in the province tend to be older, live in rural areas, and have lower incomes, lower than the provincial average. An increase in heating costs of 60% in one year already poses considerable economic hardships and stress on residents. Will the government cancel their planned tax increases on gas, home heating, and groceries today? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, Conservatives used to believe in market mechanisms and pricing to reduce uh, pollution. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Stephen Harper did before he didn't. And Mr. Speaker, the member for Durham did before his party abandoned prices and, in fact, abandoned him. The, the Conservatives have flip-flopped all over the place, Mr. Speaker. But I, I want to applaud one Conservative, Mr. Speaker, the member for New Brunswick Southwest, who says his province should go back to using the federal carbon price because at least it comes with rebates. I agree with that honourable well, member, Mr. Speaker. Good job. The honourable member for Saskatoon Grasswood. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are looking for hope. Every day, Conservatives stand up in the House to tell the stories of real Canadians who are facing the worst financial struggles of their lives, sure. thanks to the mismanagement of this government. Day after day in this House, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government stands up and tells us how well Canadians are doing. Talk about a government being tone deaf, out of touch with Canadians. Will this government finally give Canadians hope and cancel the planned tax increases on paychecks? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the MP from Saskatchewan. support in the tough times we are going through right now. Apparently his colleague, the member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes agrees with us and he understands that our doubling of the GST tax credit will provide important relief for Canadian families. I would like to believe that the member who just spoke really cares for his constituents. I hope he will show that by supporting this useful measure. The Honourable Member for Egmont. Mr. Speaker, recently Canadian seafood and fishers have been targeted by an American organization questioning our efforts to protect the North Atlantic uh, right whale. Can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans outline the measures your department has taken working with fishers to protect North Atlantic right whales? The Honourable Minister, Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. I'd like to thank the member from Egmont for his question and also for his deep commitment to fish harvesters. Canada has world-class fisheries, Mr. Speaker, and that's thanks to our fish harvesters. With measures like dynamic closures, removing ghost gear, and whale safe gear innovations, Canadian harvesters are very committed to protecting right whales. And it's working. 
So it turns out that thanks to their efforts, there has not been a whale mortality in Canadian waters for three years, Mr. Speaker. That's Canada's record, and we can all be proud of it. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Greaseback. Mr. Speaker, a generation of Canadians are struggling. From the cost of living to the student debt crisis, Canadian students and recent grads are falling behind. Instead of helping them get by, this federal government collected billions of dollars in student loan payments since 2020. As a result, Mr. Speaker, 65,000 Canadians have defaulted on their student loans. This out-of-touch Liberal government refuses to give young Canadians a break. When will the Liberal government start tackling the affordability crisis and cancel student debt? The Honourable Minister of Labour for Employment. Young Canadians and students are the future of Canada. With Budget 2022, we're investing $26 million over four years to increase the maximum amount of forgivable Canada loans by 50% in rural, in rural communities for health care workers. We had the students back every step of the way through Budget 2021. We made federal student loans interest-free until March 23. We also doubled Canada's student grants, extended the skills boost top-up to help young Canadians really get through the pandemic. We are absolutely committed to permanently eliminating the federal interest on student loans and Canada apprentice loans, and we will continue to help young Canadians. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, we are in a climate catastrophe while oil and gas companies make record profits on the backs of regular people. As raised earlier, the UN Secretary uh, General is now calling for a windfall tax on these profits. Yet this federal government continues to do the opposite, giving more public funds to the very companies responsible for the crisis. When will this government listen to the, uh, to the U UN and apply to oil and gas the same windfall tax they have to banks and life ins uh, insurers? The Honourable the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we share the Honourable Member's uh, uh, concern and, uh, and commitment to the climate uh, crisis and addressing it. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why we are, we are spending $9.1 billion on our emissions reduction plan, which is an ambitious sector-by-sector -sector path for Canada to reach our 2030 emissions on our way to 2050 net zero. Mr. Speaker, it has broad support from environmental groups, from industry to farmers, and Minister, Minister, Mr. Speaker, it's going to deliver clean air, a healthy environment, and a strong economy. Yeah. Afraid that's all the time we have for today, and uh, c'est tout le temps que nous avons. The whole to welcome the players of Team Canada 1972. Please take your seats.
is my pleasure today to welcome to the House of Commons players and representatives of the Team Canada Team 1972. I will ask members to hold their applause until I have the names of our guests. I'm wondering if I even need to go through this because everybody knows exactly who you are, but I'm going to take it from the top if everyone can hold back. Don Ari. Yvan Cournoyer. <laughs> the Honorable Ken Dryden. Ron Ellis. For Victor Hadfield, who was not able to attend, his son, Jeff Hadfield. <laughs> Paul Henderson. <laughs> Dennis Hull. Frank Mahavlich. <laughs> Peter Mahavlich. <laughs> Serge Savard. <laughs> Robert Sealing. and the late Bill White, represented by his son, Cam White. I will now invite the Right Honourable Prime Minister to make a statement to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series. Mr. Speaker, everyone loves a good comeback story, especially one that united our whole country Quite frankly, the level of unanimity in this House today is a nice thing to see, too. <laughs> Fifty years ago, before the Summit Series had even started, a lot of sports writers and hockey fans were predicting an easy win for Team Canada. At the time, a journalist of the Globe and Mail famously promised that if the Soviets won a single game, he would eat his own column shredded in a bowl of borscht. Well, it didn't take long for him to eat his words literally. There's even a picture of it. On September 2, 1972, the first match took place in the Montreal Forum. Canada lost that game 7-3. to three. In the days and weeks that followed, our team experienced ups and downs. After a loss in the fifth game in Moscow, we were up against the wall. If we wanted to win the series, we had to win the last three games in a row. It was quite a challenge. But the players kept practicing, the coaches refined their strategy, and Canadians didn't lose hope. After a scoreless first period, Canada finally produces a 3-2 victory. Game seven, Phil Esposito scores the first two goals, and Canada wins 4-3. And then, game eight. Dernier match de la série. The last game of the series, there is one minute left to play, and the score is 5-5. Five five. That's when Paul Henderson jumps on the ice. And rushes to the net. He falls. He gets back up. Team Canada takes two rebound shots, and with 34 seconds to go, Henderson flips in a shot to the goalie's left. You could hear the cheers from coast to coast to coast. <laughs> Everyone remembers where they are. 
Everyone except me, because I was only nine months old. Uh, <laughs> but I remember growing up with players like Yvonne Cournoyer and Ken Dryden as heroes. I'm even wearing my Habs socks today. <laughs> they weren't only heroes because they had won the series. They were all heroes because they taught us a lesson. They showed us how grit and hard work pays off. They showed us that even when there's only 34 seconds left to play, you never give up. And in a global example, they showed us that having a hard-fought competition on ice can go a long way even for diplomacy. Mr. Speaker, Paul Henderson once told the story of a friend calling him when the Berlin Wall fell, saying that after his famous goal in 72, the Soviets probably never recovered. <laughs> Now, I will let experts debate on whether there's any truth to that. But what is absolutely true is that the Summit Series was a defining moment in the history of our country. Mr. President, in 1972, Mr. Speaker, in 1972, our national flag was only seven years old. At the time, it was not a flag that everyone agreed with. But as Serge Savard has often pointed out, after our players won and after wearing the maple leaf on their jerseys, Canadians became proud of this symbol that still represents them today. It is a symbol of peace, democracy and freedom. It's a different place today than it was during the Cold War, Mr. Speaker. But there are parallels, and one thing remains the same. We will never stop fighting for what is right. Today, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Summit Series and all the members of this historic team, let's remember the best of who we are as Canadians. Let's continue our work to make sure people, young and old, players and fans, can be part of this extraordinary sp sport in a safe and respectful environment. Let's keep reminding the world that being polite and friendly never precludes us also being tough and determined. And let's remember that with hope and hard work, there's nothing we can't overcome. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, friends. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. It is an honour to welcome to the House today the legendary heroes of the Summit Series. To the House today, members of the Team Canada from 50, at the 50-year anniversary of their victory at the Soviet, over the Soviet national team in the 72 Summit Series. 1972 was the year that the Cold War spilled into the, into the world of sports. In July, American and world chess champion Bobby Fischer had defeated the Soviet champion and number two world competitor Bobby, uh, excuse me, Boris Spassky. And in the Munich Olympics, the American basketball team had lost a bitter and still contested gold medal game against the Soviet Union. But neither of these events produced such drama or lasting glory as the Summit Series. The series pitted for the first time the best Canadian professionals although some of them look too young to have been there, um, against the Soviet players who were at the time underestimated but preparing quietly for a surprise. It was to be the true test of hockey supremacy, played under the shadow of a much deadlier contest for global supremacy. The Canadian Ministry of External Affairs suggested that the encounter could be called a friendship series. Thank goodness uh, the players ignored that and had the good sense <laughs> to compete fiercely. Although most commentators and most Canadians expected the series uh, to be an easy one, after a shocking 7-3 loss in Game 1 in Montreal, it became clear that the series would not be a, uh, a friendly exhibition of Canada's superiority. As the losses mounted, the pressure on our players grew, the low point being the series' uh, Game 4 in Vancouver, when some of the crowd rained booze down on their defeated heroes. Canadians simply couldn't understand 
how these NHL all-stars, these legendary names that they knew so well, could be outscored by a team of Russian amateurs. The Canadian fans had not yet realized what had become clear to the Canadian players. These Russians were actually really good. They were playing a different game than the NHLers were used to. A game of speed and finesse, long lead breakout passes and pinpoint cross-ice accuracy. By the end of the series, the names of those faceless Russians would be household names in Canada. Uh, we know them now, we, know, we knew them then, and now many of them play in the leagues on this side of the ocean, uh, or they're, at least their, ans- their, 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 their children and grandchildren now do. Names and faces that Canadians would come to know and respect in international tournaments and uh, in exhibitions pit- pitting Soviets against NHL competitors. By the time the Canadian team left to train in Europe ahead of the four games in Moscow, the idea of a friendship series was long dead. From this side of the Cold War, knowing how it ends, we can afford to look back objectively. But in the moment, and at the the time, the series had become to borrow the uh, name of the 40th anniversary documentary, The Cold War on Ice. The 72 series was the first time the term Team Canada was applied to a Canadian hockey team. In the minds of Canadians and fans following the series around the world and on both sides of the Iron Curtain, Team Canada versus Team Russia had become us versus them. Two styles, two different ways of life, two fundamentally incompatible ideologies and system of of government. Democracy versus totalitarianism, communism versus free enterprise, freedom versus repression. Clichés never tell the whole story, but they often tell the most important part. This is true of the stories we are told today of the 72 series. Before the series, we told ourselves that we were the best hockey country in the world and that our way of playing was the only way to play properly. During the series, we realized that this wasn't quite true. For for having lost those four games and having seen the competitive grit and the finesse of of a team of a different style, we learned that we needed to up our game. In the last game on home ice, the frustration of Canadian fans in Vancouver's Pacific Coliseum erupted as boos rained down from the bleachers. Team Canada lost, falling 4-2. In a now iconic post-game interview, the legendary Phil Esposito pleaded with Canadians to quote the elder Esposito brother. He said, I am completely disappointed. I can't believe it. Some of our guys are really, really down in the dumps. We know. We're trying. They got a good team. Let's face the facts. But it doesn't mean we're not giving 150% because we are. Every one of us, every one of the guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country. But on foreign ice, in front of hostile fans, with their backs against the wall, down two games, Team Canada rallied to win the last three games, each by a single goal. Each of those winning goals was scored by the great Paul Henderson. His name is immortalized uh, in Frank uh, Hewitt's frantic play-by-play call that erupted through thousands, actually hundreds of thousands, and probably millions of televisions and radios in classrooms and workplaces across the country. Henderson has scored, and the crowd goes wild, of course. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience would not have been so pleased, of course, but those here on the other side of the world would have applauded and cheered with such a vibrating and powerful force that it would have been heard all around the globe. It's a call that still thrills us all half a century later. Even those of us who were born after 1972, (laughs) who have only heard the echo of those cheers, still revel in the legacy that they represent. 
Uh, well, when we hear those calls and we see those names, the names that are here today, Yvonne Cornoyer after the winning goal, for example, it takes us back to a different time and a different world. It was 17 years before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, just a few months before the wall fell in May of 1989, a 20-year-old Alexander McGilney would become the first Soviet star to defect to the West to play in the NHL. He was charged with deserting the Soviet Red Army in which he was nominally an officer. Shortly after that, a crumbling and cash-strapped Soviet hockey system and Soviet Union would come crashing down as well. Two years after that, in 1991, the Soviet Union, which in 1972 had appeared almost invincible, officially came to an end. I say almost invincible because this Team Canada showed that they were anything but. That, that is something that the Canadian spirit uh, brings alive in hockey, but also in all aspects of our lives. I think what is so special about the gentlemen gathered here today is that every single Canadian can see their own triumph in this legendary win. You've made us all proud. You've given us one of the defining moments of Canadian history. In fact, I think if any Canadian were asked to close their eyes and dream up the most Canadian moment, it would be hard to think of anything more Canadian than the 72 Summit Series victory. And so on behalf of all Canadians, I wish you a great congratulations and I thank you for your contribution to our national story and may we all live up to your incredible example of grit and determination and victory. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly, Mr. Speaker, gentlemen, I am the only leader in the House to have worn skates before 1972. With very little success, well, here I am today. The Bloc Québécois has always defended the Quebec identity. Quebec and Canada are two different nations with different values and often different ways of doing things. We are not. Uh, we defend the right to live in French, the common and official language of the Quebec nation. Sometimes in hockey locker rooms, we do not recognize ourselves in multiculturalism. The British monarchy? Well, Let's not even talk about the British monarchy. We only like dynasties when they're hockey dynasties. We have the civil code. We like clean energy. We are attached to secularism. We are two different nations, but we sometimes hold hands from time to time. We sometimes share interests and visions. Canada and Quebec are peaceful. We prefer peace to war, dialogue to the use of weapons. We are Democrats. We are concerned about poverty, injustice and violence, and we seek solutions to improve people's lives. Frankly, I believe that Canadians and Quebecers are a good bunch. And above all, what we share, Canadians and Quebecers, is the unshakable conviction that hockey is the greatest sport in the world. From Toe Blake to Maurice Richard to Sidney Crosby and Marc-André Fleury, not to mention, of course, by the huge Guy Lafleur, Mike Barcy and Doug Gilmore, Canadians and Quebecers are, without a shadow of a doubt, and we're talking just among ourselves, I don't want to seem pretentious, but I'm pretty sure we have the best players in the world. Well, maybe. I'll be so bold as to say that Quebecers have the best players in the world, but let's just share for one day. We know how to play hockey here in Canada. Well, you know how to play hockey. In my childhood, and in the childhood of hundreds of thousands of Quebecers my age, 
Guy Lafleur, score de Vell. Then someone made a save. Ken Dryden. Ken Dryden, one of the names that made young people dream. And when we say that we have the best players in the world, nothing shows it better than the Summit Series. On the one side, we, embodied by these gentlemen we have the honor of hosting today. On the other side, the Soviet superpower. This at the height of the Cold War. With the nuclear threat and the fear of a Third World War hanging overhead, the best of us and the best of them faced off on the ice. Pete and Frank Mahovlich. I haven't said these names in a while. Mahovlich, Guy Lapointe, Yvonne Cournoyer, Serge Savas, Ken Dryden, Phil Antonio Esposito, Bobby Clark, Rog Gilbert, just to name a few. And believe me, it is not for lack of admiration that I'm not naming the whole team. On the other side, the Soviet Union, the enemy of the Western Bloc, those on the other side of the Iron Curtain. They could not lose, but they did. We could only win, and we won. Absolutely magical. The Summit Series symbolizes so many things. First of all, it is better to fight on the ice with a puck and sticks than on a battlefield. And in that regard, it might be a good idea for Mr. Putin to drop Ukraine and settle with us in a four of seven. Secondly, the Summit Series reminds us that the Soviets were not only enemies. We had opponents that we could and, above all, should respect. And this is an extraordinary contribution of sport to the détente and the end, the eventual end of the Cold War. A stone of the Berlin Wall undoubtedly fell with the Summit Series. Finally, Mr. Speaker, Paul Henderson's goal. Paul Henderson scoring the greatest grinder goal in history. There's Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. There's Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And then there's Paul Henderson's goal. My honorable colleague for Abitibi Timiskamang has suggested a 21st century series where Quebec would play against Canada, a national team against a national team. Well, in friendship, of course. But there will always be things from time to time that we all like and want to do together, and that is the reason for which, 50 years later, we are here to say bravo and thank you. Thank you for the dreams and thank you for proving that if you are determined enough and courageous enough, you can achieve miracles. Thank you, gentlemen. The Honourable Member for Algoma Manitoulin, Capus Casing. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to rise today to honour the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series and the team members that captured the hearts, minds and imaginations of an entire nation. It is that rare event in sport that had every Canadian on the edge of their seat and would become legend across the nation, creating role models, inspiring songs and establishing Canada as the dominant hockey nation on earth. This series was so iconic that it has virtually no rival in terms of its significance to this nation other than Terry Fox's Marathon for Hope, and it far surpasses such historic moments in Canadian sports such as the Blue Jays' back-to-back -back championships, Donovan Bailey's gold medal sprint and Sidney Crosby's golden goal at the Vancouver Olympics. Mr. Speaker, I would like to begin by thanking all the players of the 1972 Team Canada for their historic victory in the Canada-Russia series, including the many players who have joined us today to celebrate the 50th anniversary. 
Mr. Speaker, in case you didn't know, a good lot of the players originated from Northern Ontario. <laughs> the, the Esposito brothers, Phil and Tony, learned to play in Sault Ste. Marie. Brothers Frank and Peter Mahovlich were from Schumacher. I was told not Timmins, but Schumacher. <laughs> Mickey Redman called Kirkland Lake home. Gary Bergman hailed from Kenora. And I also want to give a special shout out to the late, great Jean-Paul J.P. Perizé, the hard-working left winger from Smooth Rock Falls in my riding of Algoma, Manitoulin, Capus Casing, who scored two goals, two assists, and had the single most controversial moment in the series. But more on that in a minute. <laughs> the series is often spoken of as a parable of the Cold War these days, but I doubt that anyone playing in the series was thinking of that. The players went out there for eight games and through grit and determination brought this historic win home for our great nation. They inspired a generation of young people to embrace hockey and did so much to establish it as Canada's national sport, to the extent that this House legally declared it as such in 1994. It's the historic moments that will be remembered forever across Canada. To quote commentator Foster Hewitt's play-by-play -play at the end of Game 8 of the series, Kulnoye has it on that wing. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for it and fell. Here's another shot right in front. They score! <laughs> Henderson has scored for Canada! <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Paul Henderson's iconic Game 8 winning goal, often called the goal of the century, will always live on as part of the Canadian psyche. Phil Esposito's seven goals and six assist, assist set the pace for the entire series. And of course, J.P. Perisay's frustration at the officiating in Game 8 that got him ejected for game misconduct, which is often cited as the turning point that led to less questionable calls on the ice and strengthened the rest of the team's resolve. I am proud to say that following a recent uh, dedication, Paris's name is permanently commemorated by a sign in his hometown of Smooth Rock Falls, thanks to the suggestion of Johnny Lemieux and the support of the town council. They wanted to ensure that the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series was well marked, also as a tribute to Mr. Parizé. Mr. Speaker, Parizé was thrilled to be selected to represent Canada on the world stage, but he was so respected in the National Hockey League that he was asked to play for Team Canada as a surprise pick. He went on to have an exemplary hockey career, playing 890 games in the National Hockey League, including two All-Star games. He never won the Stanley Cup, but his widow, Donna, said how much winning gold for Canada meant to him. Mr. Speaker, I hope I was properly able to convey just how important this event was for the history of our nation. To quote the lyrics of another Canadian legend, and I'm not going to sing them because I can't do justice. Maybe the member for Tim and James Bay would have been able to do it, but not me. Uh, so from the tragically hip singer Gord Downey, if there's a goal that everyone remembers, it was back in old 72. We all squeezed the stick and we all pulled the trigger. And all I remember is sitting beside you. So Mr. Speaker, I've also been lobbied by my colleague, the MP for Windsor West, to put in a selfless plug on having the, um, the, the member um, from the team, Paul Henderson, be, to be inducted in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I was pleased to do that. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for your attention. And more importantly, I thank Team Canada from 1972 for all they have done for this country. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Much has been said already about the Summit Series win, and to be honest, I was born more than a decade after <laughs> you won. And so I think I'll share more about the legacy that you left us. The first being this idea of a best on best tournament. If it wasn't for you at the Summit Series, would we ever have seen Gretzky pass to Lemieux to win the 1987 Canada Cup? Would we ever have seen Sid the Kid at the time score the golden goal 
in Vancouver 2010. That's part of the legacy that you all left for us. It's also in you all as players across the country that bring us such pride. And as we heard for Northern Ontario, I'll offer the same plug for Waterloo Region. <laughs> the late Bill Golds uh, worthy from Waterloo. Rod Sealing from Elmira. And Don Ari from Kitchener. You make us all proud. <laughs> And last, of course, Mr. Paul Henderson. Not just the last goal, the game-winning goal in six, seven, and eight. And not just as a player, as a minister, as a motivational speaker, and as an author. Many Canadians have had the honor to meet Mr. Henderson over the years. In my case, I had that chance many years ago, introduced by his niece as Uncle Paul. What I remember most is how kind, gracious, and humble he was. In fact, he might be the only person in this country who doesn't think he believes he belongs in the Hockey Hall of Fame. <laughs> you brought together this country back in 1972 and you brought together this house in a spirit of unity today. Yeah. Your legacy. <laughs> Thank you for bringing pride to our country then and now. Thank you. Honourable colleagues, distinguished guests, hockey fans, and hockey legends. Le dernier mot, je l'ai gardé pour moi. I wanted to take the floor Every last. Canadian baby boomer remembers that long day ago. Today's school children could not even imagine the excitement their grandparents felt about watching television during the school day at school. <laughs> A few young people today would, would hardly recognize the then cutting-edge technology, this massive box-like TV that were dragged into the classrooms and into the libraries so that we could all watch the game. Our excitement was all about the game, our game, Canada's game. Et pour plusieurs, and for many, the result of this match between Canada and the former USSR also had a geopolitical importance that was more nuanced, more complex. But everyone throughout the country knew that we were living through historic moments. It was also a moment of inspiration. How many new players, be they boys or girls, put on skates for the first time after Paul Henderson's winning goal at the last minute of the game? Sporting events make magic when they bring people together. And all of you made magic on the ice all those years ago. For that, we're all very grateful. It's now my pleasure to invite all honourable members to meet our special guests in the Speaker's Dining Room, located behind chamber, the Chamber in room 233S. I look forward to seeing you. Looking forward to seeing you in the Speaker's Dining Room in 233S West Block for a reception just after the rising of the Plenary Committee. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Miigwech. The committee will now adjourn.